Welcome to the show, Gold Squadron Gays. It's the podcast where two Star Wars loving gays talk about and review their favorite Star Wars content while also being gay as hell. I'm your host, Bradley Brower. I'm your other host, Charles Rogers, and I would like to formally welcome Bradley to his Night Sister era. <laughs> oh, did I somehow make a prediction last week that instantly came true uh, without us even thinking that it was going to happen? Within days, within days of recording that episode, the the drawing, the tarot drawing that you did immediately came true. I'm like, shit, I need to do that every day. I'm like, oh, I'm really good at this. <laughs> yes, Bradley is secretly channeling Night Sister powers. I... I'm, I'm impressed by this new direction in your journey, Bradley. <laughs> this, no, I'm, so, this is, I'm so good. This is not what I would have called for you. Well, before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping things, and then we're going to talk about something that's not Ahsoka very, very quickly, as we just made a reference to. Uh, the two housekeeping things are, one, we have a new review. Oh. It is from Ann W. 1967. Five stars. Okay. And it reads, join the squad. Bradley and Charles have created a fantastic podcast where they discuss Star Wars media in a non-toxic, non-fandom menace, non-clickbait way. They're a joy to listen to each week. These are the highest compliments I can receive. Yeah, I, I like that. It's just a very, very nice review. So thank you, Ann W1967, for that lovely review. Also, super creative puns there. That was a... Uh... Have guess, you never heard the term related. fandom? Me- Hold on. No. Have you never heard the term fandom menace? No, I haven't. Oh my fucking God. Oh my. How, how do you. How, oh, I forget. So Bradley's not on Twitter in case oh, people okay. don't know. Is that. Like, oh, is that. A, is it's, a it's a Twitter thing. term. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah. But it's a self branded term. On Twitter and in those spaces, the word fandom menace refers to basically negative creation spaces. I see. People who see it as their sole mission because this is a name that they came up for themselves. Oh, God. Like, this is from them. This is from those fuckers. They see themselves as, like, on this mission to just bash the Disney era of Star Wars. Or bash the things they don't like. And it's evolved into this, like, monolithic, like, screaming, bloated thing. <laughs> okay. No, it's it's a term for the negative side of, of Star Wars fandom right. okay well that's what fandom menace is uh so i am i am sorry to have to be the one to tell you that okay. the fandom menace is a thing that exists you know those shitty videos that go around tiktok the one recently of like women are opportunists that guy you've have you not seen these no so female star wars fans are just opportunists that dude oh uh, wait i think i saw darth chaco talking about maybe he yeah. stitched that video or something or you saw something, you probably saw somewhere. either dark chaco darth chaco or you saw steph from dark yeah. side divas oh maybe that's what it was it. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. uh yeah no that guy's that guy's part of the broader fandom menace sphere so oh it, now it imagine sense. that guy but like a lot of people with twitter accounts okay i totally but there's that. more of us so Wow, that was educational for Bradley. <laughs> we were not expecting to go on that uh, mini tangent, I, but that's funny. I know, Bradley. I know you just want to talk about the Star Wars stuff and not talk about the Phantom. <laughs> but unfortunately, I do have to mention them on occasion. So thank you. Thank you, Anne, for the lovely review. It was one of the highest compliments I can be paid. And thank you to the person on Twitter. I did not get permission to shout out who it was, uh, but somebody did respond to our Twitter. So shout out to you and did point us to this specific track on Ahsoka. Do you remember back in episode one, we said we really liked the Balin Skull entrance music? Yeah. So one of our followers on Twitter did actually point us to the track is called Master and Apprentice. So if you're listening to the Ahsoka soundtrack and you want to know exactly which track we were talking about, it's called Master and Apprentice. Cleverly titled, I guess. <laughs> cleverly, cleverly titled. Well, I guess it's about Balin and, and Shin. Yeah, I, I don't like know. It. Anyway, we have another thing we need to talk about. I'm sorry, Bradley. We will, we will get to the episode. I know you're sitting here with a long list of actors from this episode we need to talk about. So back at the beginning of the episode, I made reference to the fact that Bradley has night sister powers to clairvoyantly predict the future. And the reason I did this is because uh, like a couple of days after we recorded the last episode, an article dropped on StarWars.com randomly out of nowhere. This article drops and it announces a Mandalorian and Grogu movie 
movie directed by John Favreau and produced by Favreau, Kathleen Kennedy, and Dave Filoni. At the bottom of the article, it references that Dave Filoni is in development for Ahsoka Season 2. Cut to the next day, where StarWars.com's Twitter account officially announces Season 2 of Ahsoka, with a photo of what a sketch, it was a, it's one of Dave Filoni's sketches, but it appears to be Ahsoka and Sabine standing on a statue hand, and that's all the context I'm going to provide for this. Uh, but yeah, Mandalorian and Grogu movie, Ahsoka Season 2. How do we feel about these things? I... I don't know. I feel like I don't like when Star Wars announces stuff and it's not already like in production. Oh, so because... wonderful news. Wonderful <laughs> news. It is actually going into they're both going into production later this year. They've right. been in pre-production. I should clarify, too, because it is annoying that Star Wars does this like it does it all the time. Yeah, we're still dealing with the after effects of them pulling that shit in 2021. When they were like, yeah. we're announcing 10 different shows, seven of them are getting made, and people are going to hyperfixate on the three. Uh, but no, the article did say Mandalorian and Grogu is going into production later this year, as is, uh, it was mentioned somewhere else, I can't remember if it's from an official source, the Ray movie is also going into production later this year. I think somebody right. who works on it might have said that. So actually, uh, Ahsoka Season 2 is in development, and the, uh, the Mandalorian and Grogu movie, they are going into production very, very soon. Sorry, please continue your thought. No, I, I I like that. As long as it's like guaranteed, I'm fine with it, you know, kind of thing. Yes. I don't love that they announced, like like you said, back in 2021, they were like, here's 10 different shows and here's four different movies that we're going to do in the upcoming year, all until 2025. And only like one of them has ever been actually made. And it's like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, let's not yeah, do made this. So here's all the Star Wars shows that this photo of Kathleen Kennedy standing in front of. Uh, here's all the Star Wars shows and movies. So the ones that happened were The Bad Batch, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Andor, Ahsoka, The Mandalorian, and those were the ones that are back here that are Star Wars that happened. I'm leaving out Willow, right. Indiana Jones, and Children of Blood and Bone. Oh, and Visions. Vision. So there's six of these that have occurred that have happened. The Acolyte is on this list. We know it's filmed, so I'm going to count it too. So that's seven. The ones that we know probably aren't happening are Rogue Squadron and Rangers of the New Republic. These are the two that probably are not occurring. And then finally, we have two here, A Droid Story and Lando. We haven't heard a word on a droid story since 2021, and nobody has thought to ask. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen a single article. I haven't seen anybody be like, whatever happened to a droid story? Like, they just completely forgot it existed. It's just in the ether somewhere. <laughs> uh, and Lando's gonna be a movie, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, again, it's one of those things where it's like, I can't even put any brain power into it until I see, like, a in-development article. Like, you know what I mean? Like, pre-production, every... Guys, everything is in pre-production all the time there's always pre-production on shows like they're always writing they're always doing something doesn't mean it's ever going to happen it just pre-production hell is a thing and so i feel like unfortunately star wars suffers a lot from pre-production hell where they're like here's a great idea and i mean like where's the yoda movie guys where's the boba fett movie huh that was so in it development got years and years josh ago. trank was mm. <laughs> But anyway, my point is, until I see Kathleen be like, yo, it's in development, like we are going to start production in like six weeks, then I'll believe. I, I have yet to, I'm very cynical about the Star Wars stuff <laughs> moving forward. I mean, I mean, that's reasonable at this point. They've announced so much. It, it really is coming off that problem of they, they announced back in 2021. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about. So 2021, Disney, like Investor Day or whatever, they were kind of desperate to prove that Disney Plus had staying power. And so as a result of this, they announced like 10 different shows. And then Marvel announced like 10 different shows. And they just kept announcing stuff for Disney Plus. And it got ridiculous. And like two of those shows aren't even getting made. And now it's 2024. And we're still missing two of them. Like they still haven't happened yet. And so it's like, okay, 
Sure. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm conflicted on it. The article is not clear on whether or not this is a reworked Mando season four or whether or not this is Mando season four is still happening. Yeah. That part makes me frustrated. Grogu. Like the wording on this star Wars.com article, the star Wars.com article is about as close as I think we're going to get to. Yeah. No, really. They're actually doing it. (laughs) And this one I buy because of Dave Filoni and John Favreau's involvement. Sure. But I don't I don't know. I'm I'm conflicted because on the one hand, you know, I think Mando and Grogu's story in the arc of the first three seasons of the show is done. I, I agree. I don't think they need I think to that do that story anymore. is over. I think that if it's a fun adventure story that they, you know, are at the center of, that could be fun. I I just don't know what they're gonna do to progress these characters in any meaningful way. And maybe the movie will just be fun. Like maybe it'll just be a Western style adventure that Mando and Grogu happen to be there for. But I'm yeah. uh, I, on the other hand, it looks very cool. And I like to see Star Wars on the big screen. Oh, no, so, I don't deny that. Like, it's definitely an event. I've, I've actually made a rule, like, with my roommate and my friends and stuff. Like, I don't go to the theaters anymore, like, unless it's, like, an event movie. So, right. like, I'm the same not, guy. I'm not going unless it's, like, oh, everybody and their brother is going to go see this movie. Like, the Barbie movie, for example. That was an event movie. I'm fine with going to the movies and spending a lot of money, you know, if it's, like, an event. And so, because then you're going, you know, you buy the drinks and the popcorn and the candy or whatever. Like, and you're there with your friends to celebrate and all be together with one thing i'm questioning whether or not this mando thing is gonna be like it it needs to be a really good story because otherwise i'm gonna be very mad that they are stringing this mando thing along i mean i i love mando and i love the story but i genuinely think like you said it's done the story is nicely wrapped up you could never visit these characters again and everybody would be happy you know what i mean like it would be such a nice like end for them my only thing i would say is maybe a time jump a little bit like something closer to the actual sequel movies that were like maybe like to explain where the fuck grow who is by the time Ray's around that might actually be beneficial and maybe that's a tie into the Ray movie somehow maybe Grogu's walking around you know he's a hundred years old or something by the time you know the Ray movie takes place so he can talk <laughs> or something I'm, you know I'm getting a little worried personally it, and part of my side I was less about I don't know if it's going to be the type of story that would sort of warrant an event movie which See, I also have complicated thoughts on because I'm like, uh, again, on the one hand, I don't know what sort of story they would tell. And like, if it's going to be a movie and it's going to be big and punchy and flashy, then like part of the appeal of the Mandalorian TV show was that it it was able to breathe and focus on the characters. And we got such a good look at at Din Djarin as a character. But on the other hand, like flashy stuff is really cool. My issue is I'm starting to side eye the number of movies that they, they have in development. I'm starting to side eye that a little bit and go I, I really don't want us to go back to the way we were in the late late 2010s when we had you know one a year and they were trying to pick up the pace and then they had to, to slam on those brakes to a screeching halt after solo yeah when they figured out that that releasing a star wars movie five months apart was a bad idea so i'm kind of eyeballing in like 2026 i think they've already s- looks like there's going to be two of them that are going to come out in 2026 to so probably mandalorian and grogu and ray and i'm kind of like i'm a little worried that we're going to pick up the pace on these movies again and it's going to be a repeat of the same issue to where we're putting movie after movie after movie after movie out and we're not giving them time to breathe and we're constantly right. living in that i've i've i enjoy the breaks personally between things so i'm not I'm not sure. And I don't want to sound like I'm down on Mandalorian and Grogu. I'm just kind of side-eyeing it a little bit at this point. Right. We don't want Marvel fatigue. Right. We We don't don't want Marvel fatigue to set in the same way that it has for Marvel, that we don't want it to set in for for Star Wars. And I think Star Wars is a little better equipped as a franchise to handle multiple things spinning at once. Because like Marvel, you have to, you, you basically have to tell one continuous story and that's the problem they run into. Star Wars, you can jump around as much as you want. And that's where I think it's sort of benefited. I don't know. I might I might feel differently when we learn what Mandalorian and Grogu is actually about. 
like what is happening in this movie because as i said at the beginning like it, you can do something that's interesting and character focused on mando or you can just have a, a another story that mando happens to be there for which also works really well for the character i'm like, worried they're gonna do some stupid thing where it's like you know how like always the third movie of every franchise or whatever is always like a time travel movie i feel like they're gonna do some bullshit thing where it's like um, grogu and mando try and travel to the uh <laughs> the old republic where they meet revan for no reason whatsoever <laughs> and that's gonna you want to talk about the fucking fanboys. catering to the fanboys <laughs> oh, i was gonna say lord. let's cater to them even more oh my lord no, it is going to be funny. I will say this. It is going to be super funny to watch the fanboy tears when this movie comes out. Because I don't know if you've seen this. The conspiracy theory for the last three or four years or something has been this secret fight between Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni to combat wokeness. Uh, to, to destroy Kathleen Kennedy and restore peace and freedom to the galaxy. Like, that's been the narrative. And they're like, oh, d they're finally giving Jon Favreau a movie. It's not going to be what they think it is. It's not. Did you guys watch Ahsoka? Like, <laughs> did you did you watch any of the things that Dave Filoni has done? He's he's not going to make your fucking Warhammer 40k bullshit that you want Star Wars to become. That's not going to happen. Also, I am excited because Jon Favreau is a pretty legitimately good movie director. Like, I can't remember a Jon Favreau movie that I've watched that I didn't like. Those, those are my thoughts. So I remain cautiously optimistic, Bradley. What about you? Uh, same. I think uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But I think I think it's too early to really have an opinion at this point. Awesome. I think that's a very measured and reasonable opinion. <laughs> Speaking of measured and reasonable opinions, Bradley, what are we talking about today? Oh, and I have it on, on, hold on, let me double check something. Is it seriously listed as Ahsoka episode X, part X thing, title on Disney Plus? Yeah, I think so. Disney Plus, let me 100% double check. Yeah, double check. check. I'm pretty sure. I'm super, because you said it the last two episodes, and I was like, what is going? I think they just, I think they just call it part three. They don't call it episode three even though it's the third episode i so the way i've been saying it is just episode three part three time to fly because that's the name of it because that's the name of the okay right, so right, you're, right. Do, you're doing it right then it's yeah it's episode, a mouthful but it, it's it's a mouthful but that's that's how it's technically listed on <laughs> right. disney plus part right. three time to fly it's episode three yeah all right bradley you want to you want to take us into uh ahsoka episode three part three time to fly this week, Hera tangles with the New Republic politics while Ahsoka and Sabine voyage to a distant planet. Charles, what is one thing about this episode that you liked and one thing you did not? One thing I really liked about this episode was the Hera Syndulla scene. Just that scene was a standout for me for a number of reasons. We're going to have a lot of notes when we get to that scene. Also, the return of Mon Mothma, which... I, I can't remember if I, we knew it ahead of time because she's in the trailer, but right. gobsmacked by how much she's in this show. She's in the show a lot. She's in three episodes of it. She got her own po character poster. So yeah, she got her own character poster, <laughs> which she looks fabulous, by the way. Loves it. She looks fabulous in her the new years Republic have been good Chancellor. to her since the Empire fell. <laughs> I know, right? This is like, this is my one thing. It's, it's been like, what? How many Five? years since Andor? No, it's, not five. Is that right? Since Andor, it's it's been what was that? Uh, I can't think. It's it's I been say ten. Uh, it's actually really? not been that. Yet. You know what? Actually, no. She's she she has aged well, but she yeah. has clearly aged a little. She's bit. at least ten ish years older. I mean, She's at ten ish least. years older. Yeah. Okay. Now that I stop and think about it, this is actually not that far away from from the first season of Andor. Yeah, but she looks great. She's rocking this haircut. I'm throwing this out there too. She is rocking this haircut. Loves it. Oh, good lord. So yeah, that that was my thing I liked was was that scene specifically. One thing I didn't like, the ending of the episode. It 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 really just, I remember watching this at the time and going, "Oh, it's just kind of over." Right. Wait, so so we did all that to get onto the planet and now what? And nothing happens. Like, what do we do now? Y yeah. It um, does just end like they just get just, there and then it's ends. like, OK, <laughs> which again, it's 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 written as a serial, right? Sure. It's written as a serial that you're meant to watch all of it in order. But the problem with that is it's choppy that it literally feels like they went, OK, this feels like a good point to, to episode break. They, the episode breaks are written like commercial breaks. That's my issue. And this is the first episode where it's particularly bad. 
to where the episode breaks are written because you the narrative from this one flows straight into episode four and there's no reason for us to break and wait a week and come back like it just it sort of ends on this note of them discovering a thing that every star wars fan figured out the second they saw the eye of scion and it's it's not that big of a revelation so i don't know i i didn't like the ending of this episode what about you bradley one thing you liked and one thing you did not I'm piggybacking off your didn't like I, I agree. I think the episode flow was so weird. Even when I was doing my notes for this, the latter half of the episode felt like its own episode almost like like the second they get uh, what's it called? Cetus. Cetus. The planet is called Cetus. Yeah. Once they get there, it almost feels like its own episode. Like it's a separate episode. There's the dog fight. There's the, you know, everything out like the whales, everything like it all felt like it, the beginning of the next episode. Like, oh, this is what happens when we get there. Or like it's almost like they shoehorned in the Hera section randomly and it made this episode feel longer. It, like I feel like the Hera stuff was important and it's like the good stuff, but it's like also felt like it wasn't meant to be here. Like it was meant to be in another part or maybe even the end of the last episode, maybe instead. And so I don't know if maybe that it was just a weird structuring thing for me. I didn't really care for it. One thing I did like was I liked seeing Jason. I think we had some weird expectations for what that was going to look like. And they <laughs> just subverted that and was just like, nope, it's just a kid. And I was the, like, you know what? Great. The that's kid exactly has green hair. Did. The kid right? has green hair. And that's all, <laughs> all you need to know about the kid. So that's that's what I liked about it. I did love Jason also getting his own character poster, which also this kid, well, we'll talk about him when we get to the scene. This kid absolutely knocked this role out of the park. Oh, I love him. This kid absolutely like beat the shit out of this role because he's so good in this part. And they also give him things to do in later episodes. Not really in this episode, but later episodes, they give him things to do. And it's like, oh no, you can actually act and you have fucking amazing on-screen chemistry with your mom like it's so good this kid is so fucking good in the part section one we begin aboard ahsoka's ship who yang and sabine are training ahsoka steps in and decides to give the old blind training method a try and sabine is left frustrated by the lesson but they continue to train title card part three time to fly so apparently hu yang can also train people uh, he to fight a, he has a built-in training program i guess somehow like, like i like it maybe it's to help younglings test their new lightsabers um, i'm not sure what that's true i guess that could be that would make the most sense i guess that would yeah i that was the only thing i could think of was that i guess it's for sure for him to help train the younglings with their new lightsabers to make sure they don't chop their arms off <laughs> right with the dangerous weapons that you just handed children Jedi I like order. I like the words too that he's calling out because he's clearly the way the training is working is he's clearly running her through drills and he's calling words and she has to slash a certain way. Right. I do like that little element of the training. And then he's showing on the hologram like where she was supposed to hit. <laughs> they're like off. Like <laughs> And they're like all off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I do I do like that we also have a line that acknowledges again that Sabine is Mandalorian. This is important for the character. <laughs> right. We have to keep bringing it up. Sabine has the line, I can't see, how am I supposed to fight? Which is a very obvious callback to A New Hope. Right. Yeah, I thought that was hilarious. That when he when she gave her the helmet, I was like, oh. So oh, this we're doing is the this. Lesson. This is the lesson we're doing. Okay. We're doing this. Okay. Now, the subtitles do something interesting. Yeah. It's not identified as such in the episode, but I want to talk about those swords that they're using. Okay. Those things, this is going to be apparently important later. These things are called Boken Sabers. Okay. And they are wooden swords used for tra lightsaber training. We've seen them before in the Clone Wars episode of Test of Strength and the Star Wars Rebels episode Trials of the Dark Saber. Shout out to Wikipedia for having an entry on Boken Sabers that I was just able to look at the appearances for and see if we've seen them in the past. <laughs> Again, oh, yeah, that's right. she guys, uses one, yeah. learn to use Wikipedia. It will make you sound so smart online. But these imitation lightsabers, these sort of training lightsabers, these weaker inferior variants of the real thing, are called Boken Sabers. And remember that for later. Just throwing that out there. I like that when uh, Sabine messes up the training, Ahsoka doesn't give up on the session. She says to go again. Right. She's like, uh, what did she say? Uh, your uh, anger 
and frustration unbalanced you or whatever. Yes, and I have that as a note later on in the episode, but she's she gives her a little lesson like don't let your anger and frustration rule you, which is the real point of the lesson. Right. Like don't get caught up in your frustration. But then she says, you know, let's go again. And it would have been easy for her to just like walk away from the scene. But no, they're going to keep going. And I like that little moment of character development for Ahsoka. Yeah, because I think they subverted your expectation. They were like, oh, if this were in the past and whatever the past happened, right. like clearly she would have been like, OK, that's enough for today. Like, but this clearly is like, no, let's let's try that again. Like, we, we got this. I like it. I like yeah. it. I also want to point out that that entire scene was five minutes of the episode, <laughs> which yeah. I like the scene. I'm not complaining about this necessarily, but I am pointing out that of a 31-ish minute episode, yeah, this, this was, was about really five minutes of it. This is a really short episode. This is a this short. Was this was like, minutes. I think this is one of the shortest, actually. Yeah. But I'm not going to confirm that because I don't care. <laughs> but this yeah. is this is this might be a hot take, but this is one of those things that maybe if if you were taking the show and you were breaking it down like an animated show, right? And you have 20 minute episodes, 22 minute episodes. This sequence right here and corresponding story art could have been its own 20 minute episode, like a 20 minute bottle episode. Like as now it's a slightly minute longer than it feels like it needs to be seen in an already pretty short episode. And I think it's because like I like I said, I think it's just it creeps into the next episode too much. And I think that's why it doesn't feel like it all necessarily belongs here or doesn't necessarily feel like it's the right length. Honestly, all these Ahsoka episodes should have been like 10 minutes longer each just for. Well, they episodes. needed they needed <laughs> two more episodes was what they needed. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. They needed two more. Was <laughs> they, they and this is one of those spaces where like you can feel kind of feel the thing straining because it it desperately wants to tell this story about Ahsoka and Sabine. But because it has so much plot to get through, it can't really take that time to breathe and have these nice smaller scenes with the two of them where they're not doing something to immediately advance the plot, but they're doing something to advance the character and the relationship instead. And it, because it doesn't really get them when we have a scene that is of the appropriate length, to demonstrate that it feels weirdly long in the context of the episode and i think again i don't want to level this as a criticism but it is something worth discussing how long this scene feels in the context of the episode section two we move aboard the home one where hera heads to a hollow meeting with a group of senators in the meeting she reveals that thrawn may be involved with the imperial loyalists she encountered Senator Ziono questions her motives, suggesting personal feelings, and the other senators express concerns about involving the New Republic in future conflict. After leaving the meeting, Hera runs into Chopper and her son, Jason. Bradley, right. do you want to tell us all the new characters in this uh, scene and who's playing them? Sure. I've broken them up into three sections, so we can kind of do it like this. So the first two characters uh, are introduced in the kind of as she's walking towards the room. First Officer Vic Hawkins, played by Neekin Robinson. Uh, he is known for the movie Heist 88 and the show 13 Reasons Why. And then next to him is uh, an, a New Republic uh, pilot called Lieutenant Beta, which is a... Are uh, you fucking <laughs> kidding? I hate this name. I it is ha hate this name. So I hilarious. I hate this name. Hate, um, fucking hate, hate this name. Hate the fact the fish is called Beta. I Fucking find it hilarious. Star Wars names, what the fuck? It's hilarious. What the fuck? More Lieutenant Beta. I need a Lieutenant Beta uh, comic book series, a whole entire novel <laughs> written about Lieutenant Beta. I need... Uh, no, just kidding. I just thought that was really funny. That that name is, is so random, but very hilarious. It is being played by performance artist Don Dininger. Now, we've talked about Don Dininger before. Correct. Because so. Don Denninger has also was also we talked about her back in our Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett coverage. Yep, she's been in pretty much every franchise I've ever heard of in my life. She's done performance artist work in uh lots of stuff. She's a fabricator, is what it's called, uh, mostly. So I don't know what that job. is. I don't is. think we ever determined when we did Book of Boba Fett what a fabricator is. Oh, yeah. 
As someone I, who I, works I, in the industry, I still have no idea. Yeah, I was about to say, I, I should know this. Based on the fact that she works in costume, I'm guessing it has something to do with... Um, yeah, and making costumes with the or special effects or something. The actual yeah. manufacturing of the costumes. Anyone who knows, please let us know. Because right. I would like to know what... Because this is what she does. Most of her, her credits are... It's credited under special effects... Most of her credits are as a fabricator. Uh, she worked as a fabricator for Captain Marvel, Pacific Rim Uprising, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, uh, Civil War, Ted 2, Avengers Age of Ultron. Like, she's done a lot of this for the Marvel movies. Mostly has been a performance artist and mostly in the inside, like, makeup, like, inside or inside a, a mask. Uh, but fun fact that was not in the Book of Boba Fett one, I don't think, is... One of the first horror movies that I ever actually went and saw in the theater by myself, One Missed Call, she was in that as the monster. As the One Missed Call? As as a monster. <laughs> I've never it's seen been, the movie, it's so been I years, don't know. It's been literally two decades since I, three decades, yeah, a d- decade and a half. It, it's been time since I saw this, this movie. <laughs> But she was also in that. She's cool, so shout out to her for being rad. So those are the two um, kind of buddies that Hera has. These two also get Lego figures in one of the Ahsoka sets. I don't know why. Yeah, I cut it out of our last episode because it was too long of a discussion, but we talked about this Ahsoka set, uh, Lego set, and these are the two characters in there. So there you go, bringing it back. (laughs) So Um, just slamming the gas along, who who else do we have introduced in this section? So now my second section of people, uh, the Senators. Starting from left to right, Maurice Irvine playing Senator Malwood. He's been on 911 and Snowfall. Uh, next to him is Jacqueline Antara Mian. Antara I think Mian. Is her. Okay. Antara Mian. I'm not good with reading. We apologize. Playing... I've I've done my best with it. She's playing Senator Rodrigo. Uh, she's known for the show Manifest, and she was actually in Jessica Jones. So I thought that was interesting. Next up is a little person we may have mentioned before, Genevieve O'Reilly, who is reprising her role as Mon Mothma. So, Delighted to see it. We have said everything we need to say about Genevieve to say about O'Reilly her. so far as Mon Mothma <laughs> back in our Andor coverage. Right. And then I'm skipping the uh, last senator at the end because there's literally no information on this grand alien senator uh, on the very end um, because I want you to talk about our... The only person you care about in this scene, other than Mon Mothma. Yes. Senator Amado Ziono is being played by a gentleman named Nelson Lee. Nelson Lee has uh, 53 acting credits. Most notably, he is the Chancellor in Mulan, and the live-action Mulan. And he has been in Westworld, and he has also been in Stargirl. Um, and I gave, so him a, I gave him a technicality disney trifecta because he i think was i in see the blade what... tv series in 2006 so technically that's marvel so technically he gets it i w- i will give it to him on that technicality yeah i think it's a technicality but still i mean good for him absolutely nailing it as this abs just shitty piece of shit senator so can you Hamato give us Ziona? real quick give us Give us the background of who Hamano Ziono is, because for well, some let me people you, like Bradley, me who may not know, let me ask you, Bradley. Wink. Does the name Does the name Ziono in Star Wars mean anything Ugh. to you? Unfortunately, it's the bane of my existence. <laughs> uh, the show the, we will one day cover. The only thing I don't like in Star Wars, which is the show Star Wars Resistance, <laughs> which we will cover one day, and I will change your mind on this so uh, yes the main character of resistance named kazuda ziono uh this is kazuda ziono's father mm. uh hamado ziono is a senator in the new republic he makes previous appearances again in resistance he only appears twice uh he appears his voice only in the pilot episode of star wars resistance and then later in season two he is revealed to have survived the destruction of Hosnian Prime. It's pretty clear he was supposed to be a major, more major character as Resistance went on, but then Resistance was sadly ended early. So that... Oh, is that, what they, is that what they call it now? Ended early? Yeah, it wasn't canceled officially. <laughs> like, they didn't just they didn't just chop it off. We'll, yeah. You'll see when one day we finally watch it. It's really weird because they have season two's kind of set up with a particular arc, and then halfway 
through that season, they just slam on the gas pedal, and anything that's not the immediate first order and resistance plot basically gets thrown off to the side, and and they just scream towards some sort of satisfying ending to it. But Hamato Ziono, his presence is uh, something that's left by the wayside. So resistance fans will remember him as Kazuta Ziono's shitty dad. Here being played uh, perfectly as this incredibly shit senator <laughs> who just is condescending as fuck to everyone around him so good i hate this man so much and hera plays it so well too like it's just the her contempt for him is so apparent like i love how the first officer like warns her before she goes in he's like heads up like the dude that <laughs> you fucking hate room. is in there like just just giving you a warning now you're gonna be frustrated when you go in there well, well i have a note in a little bit to talk about the points ziono is making yeah. in this hera identifies the shipyards where they had their confrontation as the santh shipyards uh i did a quick wikipedia search and it looks like the santh shipyards are in fact the main Karelian shipyards or the coronet shipyards uh, in Coronet City, and we have seen them before all over the fucking place. They're in Solo, they're first mentioned in Solo, A Star Wars Story, uh, but we've seen them in certain High Republic stories, we've seen them in the Catalyst novel, we've seen them in Res the novel Resistance Reborn, so these are the main Corellian shipyards, it turns out, was where they were last episode. The same ones that are shown in everything where the Corellian shipyards are. There's an interesting line. We have former Imperials working through every level of the New Republic government. And I have two sub points to this line. Sub point number one is yes, including your chancellor. Right. Like she did defect and run the rebellion, but Mon Mothma was an Imperial Senator. She never believed in the empire, but as a heads up, she was also an Imperial Senator. Do they, do they point out in this episode that she has been a part of all three regimes? No, like, I did. Oh, you did. Oh, okay, okay. I did. I was like, no, she has, she yeah. has more, more nerve and backbone than basically every other Imperial <laughs> Senator, except for Bail Organa, because she was the one that defected. In fact, right. she's got a little more public courage, in my opinion, than even Bail does, because she's the one that got up and said, fuck the emperor, I'm out. Which I don't think anyone else ever did. I think Bale was still a senator during A New Hope when his planet got destroyed and he was on it. Yeah, I guess I don't so, think he ever quit the New Republic, or the, the Imperial Senate. Anyway, my sub point to this is this falls along too with what Min Weaver says in the previous episode where he's talking about how a lot of the former Imperials got repurposed into New Republic. This is, this is a common theme that's coming up. So anyway, let's talk about what Senator Ziono is actually saying in this scene. He points out that it's entirely possible Hera just wants to use this operation to find Ezra, that that's all she's concerned about, and that this would be a, a waste of resources. He's an ass, but, but he's also like- He's correct. <laughs> kind of got a legitimate question here. Right, yeah. Like, it is not unfair to ask this question no of course not and it's like you're using essentially the government's resources to go on military this resources military which is an yeah. anti-military government right and they're like mm, do we really want to allocate all of our resources in this brand new budding kind of republic that we're trying to get back on track and go on these like away missions to another fucking galaxy. I mean, I don't know if they know the details that much, but like it's still all like she said, let's go do something. All she said in this meeting where she was like, uh, due to this evidence, we think that the this missing Grand Admiral is coming back. And he's like, Okay, but didn't like your surrogate son also disappear with that Grand Admiral? So like <laughs> I'm not saying you're lying to us, but right. I'm also not saying you're truthing to us either. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, about I also have to think. I have to think about it in like a. Why would she wait this long to come up with a plan to like go do that? You know what I mean? Like, if, if that really was her plan, like, oh yeah, I'm just using these resources to go find Ezra. Why would she wait like five or six years to go do that? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's or eight years, right? <laughs> like, it's like eight or nine years later. Yeah, and Hera is also not the type of person. So somebody who's more political is going to have maybe a better answer to this. Hera's like, shut the fuck up. Because she knows she's actually looking for Thrawn. 
Like, she knows that's her concern. Her frustration is she doesn't want to have to turn around and convince this random senator who didn't even fight in the rebellion. Which she brings up. (laughs) Which she brings up about the fact that, no, she can be trusted to have the New Republic's best interests at heart above her own. And one thing that's really interesting to me, too, about this scene is the acting choices Genevieve O'Reilly makes, yes, we're back to Mon Mothma again. Mon is listening very intently to everyone who speaks. Like, you can tell from her body language, she's shifting her attention around, but she doesn't actually have a lot of lines in this scene. She's just listening. She's taking in what people are saying. And that's the thing about Mon Mothma as a leader. She isn't going to dismiss Ziono completely out of hand because he's not being unreasonable with his questions. She's going to listen and she's going to say these are their fair questions. But again, Genevieve O'Reilly's performance, you can also see the gravity of what Hera is saying. Hera is basically saying, you can have another, we might have another war on our hands. Mon just fought in two galaxy-spanning wars. (laughs) Yeah, she's done. (laughs) She was involved in both of those wars. This woman has been at war effectively for three fucking decades. Oh yeah, because all the Clone Wars. All the Clone Wars. The Empire taking over. The Empire, the entire Galactic Civil War, and we've just had Jakku. So now Hera's coming into this meeting and saying, oh, by the way, there might be another fucking war. (laughs) Obviously, this is difficult for Mon. Like, this is a difficult choice for her. Because, yeah, her gut reaction should be, oh, okay, well, we'll give Hera what she wants because we want to prevent another war. But also, you can kind of tell the wheels turning of like, do we want to go down the path that the Republic went down to where preventing a war leads to militarization, which ultimately leads to war? It's it's a complicated situation for her. It's a complicated thing for any leader to deal with. Leadership is hard, actually. Running a galaxy-spanning government when you actually give a shit, unlike Palpatine, right. is hard, actually. We see this in the High Republic with Chancellor Lena So. This is a difficult thing to actually do. It's that great scene that you actually read in Light of the Jedi where she's having that meeting like a third of the way through the book. She's having a very similar meeting to this. They have like a meeting and they're trying to figure out what to do about the great disaster. And there's issues to where like shutting down the hyperspace lanes causes problems for the outer rim, but also like they don't know it's a safety issue. It's, it's very tough when you actually give a shit and you don't just want to hide in your little dark side tower and do your little evil dark side things and let a bunch of old white men fuck up the galaxy on your behalf. Imperialism is bad. Anyway, I have tangented. <laughs> We're getting back on track. Bradley, do you have any, any thoughts about this scene? <laughs> Because uh, I have a lot. <laughs> I was going to say, not much more about um, the senators and stuff. I feel like we pretty much you touched on everything in there. I think everybody... I think that Ziono is an asshole, but he's also right. I think that's the problem is he comes off like bad about it, but he's also like genuinely like, I think Hera's kind of being a little bit of a burnt, like she's kind of burning him a little bit because she's like, mm, you were just kind of waiting to see who won the war before you decided to make any, you know, decisions. But he's also kind of like thinking as a senator being like, okay, is this a practical thing or is this just a personal vendetta? And we need to really think about allocating resources based on that, not based on your emotions. Like I, well, there's no proof that Thrawn is coming back. So therefore your I can't, feelings do not right, constitute yeah. a legitimate. Well, right. and it's interesting too. I, I like this exchange about, did you fight in the war? Because it's, it, there's multiple interpretations of this particular attitude on Harris part, because on the one hand, yeah, he's he's clearly just an opportunist who wants to be in power regardless of who's in charge. And the galaxy is full of people like that. And we saw them through the Imperial era. We saw them all the way back in Mandalorian, uh, season season three, episode three, the, the Dr. Pershing episode where he has that conversation with the senators. And the senators are like, ah, New Republic, Imperial, doesn't really matter. But on the other hand, like, the way that the line is is delivered, the the way that she the wording that she chooses in this moment makes it sound like only people who were active military or were fighting and like running around in the rebel bases and doing that should be the people in charge of the government. And also like we have seen that those people do not do a particularly good job of being in charge of the government. Right. Hello that one guy in Mandalorian in the requisitions office who Carson Tevis having an argument with you remember that guy right 
the guy that he's having like the argument with in like episode five that guy was formerly like he served in the the rebellion so maybe those guys aren't the best at actually running the government i don't know it's there's there's a lot of layers to this scene well his book ended with a reunion that I didn't think was going to happen because earlier in the scene, Mon Mothma goes, how's your son, Jason? Or whatever. And we were like, oh, name drop. Like, that's so cool. Name drop, like, name drop. And I thought that was it. Like, I thought we were just going to mention, she's like, oh, he's around. Like, the way she said it in the beginning, they trick you into thinking that, like, oh, he's not going to show up. Like, he's, it's just like, oh, he There's might no be around fucking here. Way. They're like, oh, he's yeah. running around with Chopper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just here somewhere. And then he does show up, uh, played by Evan Witten. Uh, known for Mr. Robot and Next. He's also been in Penny Dreadful City of Angels. Um, he's been in a couple of other TV shows. So now we can talk about Jason as like a character too. Oh, I do I... also want to say, Bradley, that this might have been a surprise to you. It was not a surprise to me. <laughs> because I saw the Ghost Lego set leaks. And I saw that Jason right. was listed on the thing. And so I was kind of waiting for him to show up. Well, I kind of I mean, knew he was coming. I mean, I saw he was on the Lego thing, but you know how sometimes, you know how sometimes Lego likes to do this thing. Well, they'll just put random characters in a set for no fucking reason whatsoever. And they have no connection to the actual visual media thing that came out anyway, i.e. Marvel sets in particular are probably the worst offender of this, I would say. They'll be like, here's the Hulk in this random Spider-Man set. And you're like, he wasn't in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so stuff like that but i i like that jason showed up he's definitely an interesting character i think that they really need to watch him as a character uh he needs to be kind of more of an integral part of the story moving forward as just it just as an interesting character because he has so much history in the cartoons like who his lineage is i mean i you know star wars loves good lineage they um, will they will just straight up mention kind of well ki they will kind of mention his dad kind of right yeah because he says uh what does he say he's like i want to be a jedi and she's like yeah i know you do <laughs> yep yep so like direct reference to kanan jarrus which is great i mean i'm like fingers crossing hoping that one day we'll get some kind of kanan flashback uh, with Freddie Prince Jr. playing uh, Kanan live action just for like a second, even though he's always said he's never going to come back to the character. I know. I think they should recast the character, but that's that's an entirely separate discussion. Oh, OK. Well, we definitely uh, don't have time for that. Discussion I love Freddie Prince. Jr. I love Freddie <laughs> Prince Jr. in the part, though. But for this particular yeah. show, they should recast him. We don't have time for that. That discussion. I would like to hear Freddie Prince Jr.'s voice if they do the voice. I'm sure Dave Filoni could get him to come back to do the voice. He seems to like Dave Filoni. Sure. Anyway, yep, so Jason here, pictured here with the green hair, or shown here with the green hair, I say pictured because I'm looking at a picture of him. <laughs> I don't think we get the green tips to the ears. I don't think we ever see his ears. In I don't the think show we ever all. see his ears in the show at all. Which is smart of them to have his hair long because then we don't see it. <laughs> then we don't but... see it. Uh, he's running around with Chopper, which As is hilarious should. to me. <laughs> he's just like, this is my pet cat, and it's Chopper. Right. Like, Chopper's very pet cat that loves the kid and only the kid. Uh, which, again, friendly reminder, Jason Sindula is named after uh, Jason Solo from the Legends continuity. Hopefully does not go the same route as Jason Solo from the Legends continuity. You say that, but I kind of think that that would be a great idea. It, uh, I actually think, now that we know that there's a season two, hear me out, Ezra's come back. Somebody's got to train Jason, and Ezra's right there. Bradley, how much do you know about Jason Solo? I know nothing. I can tell. <laughs> I can fucking tell. But, no, but, I, I do think great. we may get Ezra training this kid. I do hope this kid does not grow up to be a galactic mass murderer and uh, issue in a potential new reign of the Sith. Spoilers for Legends, but that's what happens to Jason Solo. <laughs> I mean... It wouldn't be a bad idea only because you got to give Ray something to do in her movie. And so therefore this having this uh, kid who randomly turns evil for no reason of which I can explain right now and lead. A yeah, Jason turned generation. evil for no fucking reason in Legends. Too. I oh, know okay. they said there was a reason. It was a stupid reason. I'm going to go with I like Jason Sandula being evil. I just Jason Sandula, future Sith Lord. Because a green haired uh, evil dude fighting Ray, like I wanna see that. I really how I feel old, like that's a thing. How old is Ray at this point? I Ray I, hasn't 
Has she been Ray, born? I think it's just being born. Right. She's like, yeah, fresh. <laughs> she's fresh. Um, she's certified fresh. Certified fresh. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Um, she not a plug. She is. Yeah. Because yeah, what Jason's like, tomatoes. what? Maybe like eight, nine, ten here. Because he would have been born right after. Yeah. He's got to be like ten. Something like that. Right. Well, just, uh, our argument is anyway, it old. rules. It yeah. rules. It rules to see him. I'm very excited to see his dynamic with Ezra in season two. And I'm very excited to see more of this character as we know he is coming throughout the season. Exactly. You already covered my notes on him saying he wants to be a Jedi. And here is like, yeah, of course you fucking do. Yeah. She's like, God damn it. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but she's like, well, he's not really displaying any force sensitivity yet. Horrible news on that horrible news on just, that Hera. just wait a wait an episode or two Hera. wait a couple episodes <laughs> section three back on ahsoka's ship sabine has finished training and chats with ahsoka on her dirty floor table in the cockpit <laughs> in the cockpit hu yang and ahsoka discuss sabine's potential Hera sends them a hollow message informing them the republic will not provide backup but is cut off as they arrive to the planet due to the signal being jammed okay so i i, I promise that the episode this episode is going to pick up pace i was gonna say this we, is about the part where it's it about the part yeah. where it's about to pick up pace so if you thought that we've spent a lot of time talking about the politics of this episode and there's a lot of episode left don't worry it's going to pick up the pace but i have a lot of notes for this section uh, so my first note is that it's interesting that, that Sabine is like, basically, throw me into the the fight. And let me learn that way. And Ahsoka's like, mm, no, it's a bad idea. You, have, you realize why Ahsoka thinks that's a bad idea? Probably because of Because that's how she trauma. got trained. Her <laughs> entire Pada One experience. And this will be addressed later in episode five. Her entire Pada One experience. From the moment Anakin agreed to take her to as, as a Pada One to the moment she walked away from the Jedi Order was in wartime. She never, in her entire experience as a Pada One, had a moment to take a step back and have these quiet training moments. Right. We see that it kind of happened. We see in Tales of the Jedi it kind of happened. But even when, in that Tales of the Jedi episode, see this is retroactively making that Tales of the Jedi episode mean something to me. Because in that episode, she has a more traditional lightsaber thing. And Anakin's like, no, 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 I'm going to train you specifically for wartime. Anakin is like, the, the method of training that we're using so far isn't effective in this day and age. I'm going to teach you how to actually fight, which in hindsight is a big fucking red flag. And now she's saying, I don't want to repeat that mistake. I don't want to perpetuate this cycle. I'm going to take the time to actually make sure you know what you're doing before we get you on the field. And you're not fucking 14 years old on the battlefield. You're not right. a goddamn, even the Sabine is an entire whole ass adult. <laughs> but Ahsoka's like, I am not taking you, I'm not putting you out there before you're ready like I was put out there before. I mean, she she kind of was ready, but if she hadn't had Anakin there, there were multiple instances where she would have just died. Right. And she's very capable that, yeah. in the Clone Wars, but she's also 14. <laughs> like, Which, yeah, uh, it's not great. And also, I think, well, it becomes more apparent in Episode 5, but like seeing well i'm not going to spoil it but she is clearly 14 and it it's becomes like obvious, very visually very apparent. apparent too she yeah. was too young to be too in young. Clone Wars. The, the cartoon does not do it justice uh, to make you believe that she's a fucking child <laughs> because they put her in that stupid fucking tube top and it it's yeah. fucking her design in the first two seasons of the clone Wars show i have massive issues with yeah no her updated design i think in season seven is like my kind of like go-to uh, like that's like the one i like the most i like her post season three design i i like it but more than the tube top i also do like how they seen remember last episode we talked about it was clarified somewhere about how talent is just you know one part of it and blah blah blah, blah. it was actually this scene oh it's actually okay. this scene it's it's delightfully uh because dave filoni is actually a pretty good writer it is actually clarified in the episode itself. In the episode itself. In, right. in the series itself. It does not need to be explained in an interview. The Even though he will tell probably you, had to turn around and say it in an interview, be like, well, in this episode, I did say. <laughs> I saw an absolutely stupid fucking tweet that I was about to respond to, but I didn't want to give the person attention, where they were talking, they were showing the the Ray jumps over the, the uh, TIE fighter scene from Rise of Amazing. Skywalker. Loves it. And somebody responded as a day at the movie, why doesn't he just shoot her? To which I wanted, I was 
was going to say, and then I talked myself out of it because I didn't want to give the person attention. I was going to say, he does not want to kill her. He wants to turn her to the dark side. <laughs> this is explained in the movie by him saying, I want to turn you to the dark side. <laughs> right. I hope this helps. <laughs> and I was yeah, like, that, why am I going to end the movie right here? First of all, uh, and kill her. Like those make any sense. Anyway, yeah, one, the plot needs to happen Two, the character right. has expressly stated his <laughs> motivation in the movie with the words, I'm going to turn you to the dark side. It's, it's nice to see, yeah. it's nice to see when a piece of media in Star Wars kind of explains why it's doing what it's doing. And I really appreciated this scene. Again, I wish that this scene and the scene at the beginning of the episode and the Hu Yang scene had been one 20 minute episode. I want more of this. I want this relationship dynamic between the two of them to be more explored. Because the second we hit CTOS, the plot is going to, as my partner would say, plot go vroom vroom. Yeah. It's the action. It's just going to slam the on the gas pedal. Afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just going to slam on the gas pedal and they're not even going to fucking see each other again until like episode seven. Yeah. It's so strange. Anyway. But I like how this, this scene explains the lore of like, no, the force runs through anybody. Anybody can use it. This is why also I dislike whenever there's something that's disconnected from the force. Legends did this a lot. I'm not going to bag on the Yuuzhan Vong too much, but the Yuuzhan Vong kind of fell into this. Uh, and then I, I wasn't a big fan in hindsight of the Yisela Mary. They were cool at the time, but the idea that something, a living thing can be disconnected from the Force, I don't think really works. Even, even the Leveler in the High Republic, the Leveler in the High Republic is still connected to the Force. It's just complicated and I'm not going to spoil it for Bradley. You know what else I really liked about this scene, Bradley? And also this section? The music. Oh. The fucking plucked strings. A plus music, even in the quiet moments, which is something I really love about you Kevin Kiner's it, yeah. music in this show. Is even The music is a banger even when it's not being giant and epic. Hu Yang in this scene is interesting because Hu Yang is kind of acting as the voice of the traditional Jedi Order for Ahsoka. Right. It's somebody that Ahsoka can contrast yeah, he's always like, he's got to be always that voice of, well, I say reason, but it's not really reason. It's the old way of things like, or this is how everything should be done. Or this is the way that we were supposed to be doing things. And Ahsoka always keeps bringing it up. And she's like, yeah, but there's a reason why the Jedi aren't here anymore. There's a reason why they lost essentially the war. Like, so we're not going to do any of that shit because it doesn't work. Part of the interplay between Ahsoka and Hu Yang is, is finding the balance, because everything comes back to balance, balance in the Force, balance in life. The, much of the philosophy of Star Wars revolves around balance, and part of the, the conflict between Hu Yang and Ahsoka is finding the balance between the old way and the new way. That the old way should not purely be discarded because there are things of it that have value. Hu Yang is right when he says things. He is a dispenser of wisdom, but also he is set in his ways and he is inflexible. And Ahsoka is more flexible due to her experiences as a Ronin, as Fulcrum, as somebody out who has existed outside of the Jedi Order. So I think that it's it's a really inspired choice to have these two characters bouncing off each other, debating, essentially debating philosophy. These scenes where they have that they debate philosophy. Also, Rosario Dawson and David Tennant are just knocking both performances out of the park. So it's just really fucking good. Every time Hu Yang speaks, I just get excited. Like, I'm just like, what is he going to say next? Like, what? Like, he's, I don't know. He's just so good. Speaking of him speaking, his line about uh, you come from a long line of non-traditional Jedi. And I'm like, I thought about the lineage for a second. His Ahsoka to Anakin. Right. Anakin to Obi-Wan, who's probably the most traditional Jedi in this bunch. Obi-Wan to Qui-Gon Jinn. <laughs> Qui-Gon Jinn to Count Dooku, and then Count Dooku was trained personally by Yoda. I mean, I guess it wasn't really, was it really that unconventional up until Obi-Wan? I mean, it seems like it's pretty standard. Qui-Gon Qui was out there. Was Qui-Gon uh, was yeah. super out there. He, It's not clear in the Phantom Menace movie so much, but Qui-Gon's a bit of a, like, insane hippie Jedi. Like, he's a little weird. Uh, I highly recommend the book Master and Apprentice by Claudia Gray. Also, that may be one to add to your list, Bradley, when you're finished with Percy Jackson. Um, no, but I thought there the the lineage of masters is very interesting. I also just realized that after after you went through all that, um, the very sexist uh, Ahsoka being the only woman that they have trained in their lineage. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. 
I just no, randomly no, just, you could yeah. break. You, that's the problem. That's why this disaster lineage happened. Is they're all men, and, and then the one, it, the, the, the one competent broke. one, yeah. the one competent one is Ahsoka to Sabine. Yeah, this is the one where they're like actually trying. I like it. <laughs> We get this lovely scene where Sabine is trying to force pull the cup, and I'm like, yeah, we've all done this, Sabine. Like, every single one of us has waved our hand to, to open the, di- the, open the, the door. Yeah, every the single door. one of us as a kid tried to, like, force push something oh, to every see time. if we had the force. Every time I go to Target or the grocery store or something, I literally just, like, slightly move my hand. Like, Oh, know, yeah. You, know, you you're always like... move your hand to open the door. But Love also, it. I just want to shout out natasha's acting in this scene when she has the line to the cup she's like you win this round (laughs) like she's so sabine red i love it a lot of people were very mad about the fact that the the senate oversight committee said no to the mission and mon mothma just kind of went along with it and i'm like what the fuck was she supposed to do yeah guys she can't just was she supposed to override right her her oversight committee those committees exist for a reason and the reason is to avoid one person having the unilateral authority to decide these things you know what happens when we have one person with the unilateral authority to decide these things we get palpatine that is what happens when you do this and mon mothma recognizes this so is this a decision she necessarily seems to agree with not necessarily it's hard to tell but is it a decision she's going to respect because she believes in democracy, the rule of law, and that the law ex- extends to everyone, you know, that she's not an exception to that and can't just overrule it because she's the chancellor. Also, yes. So I get that from the point of view of our main characters, it's very frustrating, but she is not only acting within the bounds of her character, she's doing the ethically correct thing. She right. went to the oversight committee, the oversight committee looked at it and said no, because she, uh, Hera doesn't have the proper authorization. We'll get to back to that in a couple of episodes. I do want to think. And Mom's like, like, "Okay, we're gonna. We're, we're this is this is the decision that was made, and we're gonna go along with it." I also want to know, like, okay, I guess does that, not like, make the, her a weak chancellor. This makes her good at her job. I know that, like, she had to do that, but like, also seeing as Hera is quote unquote a general, and we will talk about this later on. Why would she not just be like, "Hey, go do this anyway." <laughs> <laughs> so like, which they that kind is, of do later on that but is like, an interesting choice i think that even though she's what i'm getting is that even though she's a general she can't deploy the fleet in a major military maneuver that could be seen as aggressive without authorization of the oversight committee and even though she's aware that something is going on she fails to convince the oversight committee so she can't like move the entire fleet she could probably take I don't know if she could even take the ghost at this point. It would be a question of what the New Republic military is empowered to do. If they have to act in defense, and this could be seen as a move that is aggressive toward the Imperial Remnant, or, you know, what's what's going on. Let's let's put a pin in this and try to analyze this when we get to the scene later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll put a pin in that for now. Section four. As they approach the system, they are attacked by starfighters, including Merrick and Shin. Dogfight ensues, and they begin to approach the Eye of Scion. And Morgan opens fire on the ship. She successfully knocks out their power, and they float aimlessly in space. While Sabine works on restoring the systems, Ahsoka exits the ship in a spacesuit to distract the starfighters. Sabine manages to restore the ship's systems, and they flee into the planet's atmosphere with Shin and Merrick in pursuit. You just summarized like half the episode. I ha- trust half me, when the I would, fucking episode is everything when, he just said. When I was doing these last sections, it's almost like it all flowed in one big section. So I like I really had to split it up as best I could. And I was like, all right, well, all the talking can be in the first section. And then I was like, well, the second section could just be like the dog fight. And then the third section can just be like the whales and shit. And I was like, all right. So I don't know. This was a really fun little scene. I love I mean, you can definitely see the World War Two kind of influence oh 100 percent uh, like almost down to the ship's design like the starfighters designs they're so fucking cool oh my yeah. god the minute i watched this because i watched it the first time and i was like eh, okay that's pretty fun i was watching it again to do my notes and i was like wait a minute those are fucking world war ii bombers yeah they're planes. like they're, they're not even literally like trying designed to, to yeah. look like the planes <laughs> yeah. that is so fucking cool 
I really I liked that. It. This was the moment I decided I was going to buy the like the two Lego sets yeah. from this show. Uh, the three Lego sets from this show. Is I was like, I have to have these bombers. And they're all pretty much from this them. episode. <laughs> uh, they will they will come up again, I think, later on. Uh, I don't know whether or not they will turn up again. Well, I like Shin's uh, because hers is different because she's the leader. She's the uh, leader. So hers has to be different. And so we know uh, that she's the most important character, that hers is... Yes yellow or something <laughs> like, i right. i i like how so sabine like is having her conversation with ahsoka while she's in the tail gun and uh ahsoka tries to dispense jedi wisdom to her and Sabine's like now is not the time for a lesson girl it is the jedi way that it is always like, time always for a time. lesson yeah there's always time for a lesson <laughs> like that's that's how the jedi work right everything is a lesson mvp of this sequence though has to go to hu yang <laughs> And specifically the line, I have several thoughts on what's going on. <laughs> Hu Yang tries to kind of get them to coordinate with each other. They're not really doing it. I do like how we are reminded that Ahsoka is, in fact, Anakin Skywalker's Padawan in that she is a pretty good pilot. She's no Anakin and she's no Hera, but we've also seen throughout the Clone Wars, she can pilot. She's an above average pilot. Right. Like, so I did like that. Didn't like Maroc speaking. That was confusing. You mean his only line, which is like, uh, you got it or something like that? Yes, Lady Ren or something that he says. Uh, Voice, apparently, by Paul Darnell, who is the person inside the suit. Oh, okay. And I remember you and I discussed this because there was also conspiracy theories, too, because I think Sam Witwer is in the special thanks credits. He does, yeah, as additional voices or something, yeah. No, he's in the special thanks. He's not credited as anything specifically. Oh, in, just on, in I guess on things. IMDb, he's credited as additional voices or something at the very, like, just not for the for show. This episode. Not for this episode in particular, but just. Yeah, the, but just for the show. And so people are like, oh, is that. They thought it was him. Yeah. Is, is that, is that Starkiller? Are we doing Starkiller? Shut the fuck up. No, we're not. It, There's it still was a chance. Just, I'm just kidding. It was confusing. Well, like, we're going to discuss this in depth next week next week like, I, and i have talk? i have a point i finally got it like when we were when i've been doing my notes for this and i've been watching rewatching it i actually think i understand the character now and so i'll okay. be able to give my explanation for it next week because Why i think i finally understand did they what make it is. this choice with this character yeah. i think i like, finally how could he talk how can he, knowing yeah. what he is like what yeah. he turns out to be how the fuck can he talk i don't i don't i don't understand <laughs> i don't get it I don't I, understand. I have a very it. loose, so maybe, very loose maybe you can explain it to me. Yeah, it's very because loose. Because <laughs> I, I don't yeah. get it. I don't understand. Help, help it make make it make sense make to it me make sense. because it doesn't currently. Um, I love Shin's line. Congratulations, you almost got them. Right. <laughs> She's so shitty. I, well, I love that. Like Morgan clearly is employing them, and then also is like, I don't trust them enough as far as I can throw them kind of thing. Like she's like, eh, well, if you want to do something right, you got to do it yourself kind of mentality. Like mm-hmm. she's like, they're kind of here for like extra security. I don't really need them, but like they're here. <laughs> it's, it's going back to the continuing theme in star Wars. And it's a repeated theme. It's a continuing repeated theme that the bad guys don't know how to cooperate with each other. They are entirely selfish and entirely self-centered and they don't know how to work together. Whereas the good guys learn to work as a team. This is through all of Star Wars, like forever. That has been one of the core themes. So Ahsoka, <laughs> Ahsoka, while Sabine is repairing the ship, gets the bright idea to go out and fight several starfighters in space with her lightsabers and wins. Arguably one of the coolest scenes I've ever seen. <laughs> Arguably, look. And it makes no sense. <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are moments, there are moments where I'm just like, yeah, this is, this is peak Star Wars. This is one of those moments when she takes out a starfighter in space with just her lightsabers. I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah, no, this is the kind of thing. You know, we were talking about Mandalorian and Grogu. This is the yeah. kind of thing I'd want to see on the big screen. Oh, 100 percent. This is the kind of thing. This is the kind of shot sequence that I'm like, yeah, you you belong on a movie theater screen because of just the action levels of, of what's being done here. Yeah, it's very, what, what is your favorite thing to say? A Fast and Furious Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> so I borrowed that from Steph and Chris over at Dark right. Side Divas. It's Fast and Furious Star Wars. And what that usually is in reference to is a plot issue that we just have to gloss over. Maroc speaking. Sure. 
Fast and Furious to... Star Wars. Yep. Why does he do it when he turns out to be redacted in the next episode? Why is he able to talk? Why does he have some sort of free will, apparently, uh, to make his own independent decisions? Fast and Furious Star Wars, we move on. Another meaning could also be this scene is just really big and cool. Does it make sense? No. But no, we move on. But, but because we it like rules. it. Yeah, because it's cool. I love it. Uh, also, shout out to the specific shot of her floating by the window. <laughs> <laughs> She's floating in space. Yeah. <laughs> Which Sabine's like, Ahsoka. And Ahsoka just sort of floats by the window like, hey. <laughs> She's like, are you are you done yet? Are like, we done I yet? Come, yeah, I need to come back in. So I, I was going to say that I, I didn't understand what Sabine's character arc was supposed to be in this episode for the final thoughts. Looking at my notes, I did just get it. And again, it's it's subtle Sabine in the opening scenes of the episode is demonstrating a lot of frustration that that's kind of her fatal flaw. She gets frustrated and she makes bad decisions. Hu Yang, a thing we didn't mention, Hu Yang, the ship gets blasted and Hu Yang gets shut down and Sabine has to fix the ship by herself. And she could just reactivate Hu Yang. She could spend her resources to try to do that, her finite time, or she could fix the ship. And in frust- she's, she's getting more frustrated, which we see she keeps looking to Hu Yang. And Ahsoka has to tell her, like, don't deal with Hu Yang, fix the ship. And she ultimately has to make the choice to focus on the ship rather than get even, give in to her frustration and just activate Hu Yang to let Hu Yang do it. Because Hu Yang comes back on seconds afterwards anyway. Like, she would not have had, she would not have actually had the time. I think that was supposed to be the arc for the episode. Two things. One, I, I only just now am realizing that. And two, I don't know what Ahsoka's arc in this episode was supposed to be. Once again, Sabine is getting most of the protagonist beats. Yeah, it's not. It's, I mean, I don't really I'm not really getting like the Ahsoka show right now. It's definitely the Sabine show so far. Um, but even you're right. I don't know what she was supposed to learn from this episode other than like trust me as a master. Like, I don't really know what it is. Like, I have to trust in. Like, I have to trust in Sabine, maybe, or I have to I have to rely on Sabine. Like, that might have been what they were going for, but... The, it's very I, loose, though. I hate I to know. say, look, I hate to say, like, they need to be... It needs to be more blatant, because I don't want them to turn to the camera and say, this is the theme of the episode. But the fact that maybe has to be appended to a lot of the discussion of what the character arc was... It's it's so wrapped up in the events that are happening, which are very cool events happening on screen, that it's kind of drowning out the thematic elements of the character arc for me. That's sort of the issue that I'm having here, is I have to go picking it, it, picking it apart to try to find what the character arc is. And they exist. They're happening. Like, it's also incorrect to say that the characters are not changing over the events of the show. But you kind of have to go looking for what that arc is supposed to be contrasted to, you know, something like Rebels, where it's much clearer, you know, how the characters are progressing and particularly each episode. And the sort of the difference, too, is that Rebels could kind of have episodes where you are more focused on the plot or you're more focused on the world building. This ep- this only has eight episodes and it doesn't really have the time for that. And so that's also part of why I'm like it needed to be two more episodes because I feel like if they could have stretched it out a little bit, they could have had moments to reflect and moments to pause and let the character arcs sink in. This sure. is sort of my issue with this this series as a whole that we're going to run into. Yeah, I also feel like Merrick had more character development in this episode than anybody else. <laughs> well, Merrick's just kind of there. <laughs> I'm joking, but like it's kind of like semi true because uh, okay, yeah, has, I mean, like, you know, what I mean? Anyway. yeah, because he sees character development, and then he can speak. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a pretty that's big character. character. That's a pretty big development. If he can say yeah. words. Congratulations! But I think that whole anger and frustration thing that was mentioned at the beginning of the episode was supposed to be the thing that Sabine overcame, right? And it is there. We see it in the shots. We see it in in how Natasha chooses to play that part. We see it in the ultimate moral that Hu Yang was going to come back online anyway, but. There, th- that's that's my dissertation on this episode. Section five. Finally, in the atmosphere, the group encounters a pod of Purgle. They use this distraction as a way to escape from pursuit. Ahsoka lands the ship in a clearing in a forest, and Hu Yang informs the pair that his scans show the giant structure is a giant hyperspace ring 
theoretically able to travel between galaxies. Meanwhile, Balin assembles a task force to hunt down the group who have taken refuge in the forest. So we get our first real solid look at live action Purgle. Which are massive. <laughs> Which are fucking massive. <laughs> Gigantic. Fucking massive Purgle. They are cool. They are from Rebels. I want to again point out uh, when Shin and Maruk are flying around uh, trying to find them in the Purgle, you can once again see the moisture from the clouds on the windshield. I like it. Which is a very cool detail. Uh, my only other note for this scene, right? The scene between Ahsoka and Sabine is very nice. Uh, I have no notes on it except that it's very good. It is a lovely, it is that moment of character building that I've desperately been wanting, uh, where Sabine is like, hey, I haven't seen the Pergil since Ezra disappeared and I'm feeling kind of weird about it. And they have a conversation. I like that. I, I like the, this interaction between these characters. Then Hu Yang comes, like, finishes his scan thing. Yeah. And is like, so potentially it's capable of going to other galaxies, which the Jedi apparently knew about. Right. Yeah, he's, he's like, in my history or whatever. In my like, histories, we've yeah. been to other galaxies. And I'm like, wait, hold on, back up. The, Je the Jedi knew about other galaxies? I guess so. Huh? What? When was this going to come up before? I guess it's coming up now, but what? Yeah. Huh? I don't know. That line particularly had me asking questions. Do you have any any notes for this section, Bradley? I mean, it was like like you said, it really just kind of like it's that one little bit of action with the Purgle. And then it's just kind of like the episode is over. Like, it's not really like it doesn't do anything. There's nothing really happens other than the characters learn about the hyperspace ring, really. And then they're just kind of confused. Uh, then randomly Balin at the end is just like, all right, go get him. Like, oh, yeah, hanger. Balin's also yeah. here. Like, I forgot to mention, <laughs> Balin's also here. Like, he's randomly the episode ends with a shot of Balin standing there, like, ominously waiting, like, the, the Arthas Menethel sitting on his throne, kind of just waiting for people to show up. Yeah. That's and a, I think, the, I the think World this of is Warcraft where... reference is courtesy of how much I've been thinking about Wrath of the Lich King lately. Oh, this is also where I feel like the two extra episodes would have come in handy, is giving Balin something to do. Like oh yeah, he's other barely in this on. episode. I mean, he just was there, like at, uh, randomly at the end. Like you could have literally replaced him with Morgan on the ship and being like, "Go get them" or whatever. Like yeah. it would have been exactly the same outcome. <laughs> or like, like Morgan just, yeah. calls Balin and is like, "They're right. they're they're down on the planet. Go get them." And then Balin like says no, and he says they'll come to me or something. Yeah, something. And and like. But as it stands, yeah, it's it's just kind of ending with reminding us that Balin is there waiting for them. Yeah. So oh. it's, yeah, the episode just kind of abruptly ends at that point. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have any final thoughts on this episode, Bradley? Uh, I was just going to say directed by Steph Green again. That was the only. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, the action directing of the scene, this episode was fantastic. No, she did a great job. I think, I think the actually funny enough, I, whereas I think I like the front half of the episode better because of all this, like the actual stuff in it. I think the latter half is well directed in that, like it's just a good action bit. Like it's just really good. Like there's no, I have no notes on any of the action. I feel like it's 10 out of 10 great. No, it's absolutely a plus perfect action directing. Who wrote this episode? Uh, for spoilers for the rest of the season, Dave Filoni wrote everything. <laughs> <laughs> spoilers for the rest of Ahsoka, but Dave Filoni did also write this episode. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now do you have any final thoughts on the episode, Bradley? My final thoughts are, it definitely felt like a half episode and a half episode mushed together. Um, I, I think structurally it's a little questionable what they did. However, each part is very good. I just don't think it was laid out correctly. And I think that you have that same sentiment throughout the rest of this show. It's just that, that is correct. It's Spoilers just, it's for so my good. opinion. Like the, the show is so good in its moments. It's just not quite laid out correctly. Like it's just not quite sewn together in the masterful way that it should be. Um, and I feel like this episode really suffers the most from it, probably because it's the shorter of the uh, season. I don't know. It says it's only 32 minutes, I think. And it's not as good as like some of the other episodes, but I mean, I, I don't think it was a bad episode by any stretch of the imagination. I just think that it was a little too short and I wished it was longer. 
I basically concur with everything you just said. I think that the episode one had a pretty clear through line. Episode two had a pretty clear through line. Those two had a through line that continued through the two of them. And now we've entered sort of the the area of the show where the cuts are going to get re- even weirder, in my opinion. It feels like just the balancing is off. Like You're right, Like the first half of this episode really stands on its own as its own kind of little thing. And then they get there and the the back half of it feels like the first half of the next episode, which the next episode is going to end really, really well. Like it's going to end in a really solid point. And the episode after that is going to feel like two episodes that are kind of smushed together. It's it's inconsistent kind of how this is laid out. And yeah, I, I feel like that's, you're quoting me saying that uh, it, I, I like all the parts of this individually, uh, but when you look at the entire thing, you're just like, I'm a little confused. Right. That continues to be. And this is one of the episodes, if not the episode in which it is the most apparent. Where they're chopping this episode, and also like, I think it goes back to the fact that we have to go looking for the character arcs. They're there, but we have to go looking for it. If it had been clear that Sabine had an issue with frustration in the opening scene and in the climax of the episode, she overcame that frustration and successfully got the ship back online, then that, I think, would have made the episode feel like it wasn't chopped up. But as such, we're more looking at, because of how the the episode is written, we're more looking at the plot events that occur. And in terms of the plot events that occur, it feels like the first half of the next episode was chopped off and put on the end of this one. Which is not to say, again, that it is a bad episode. It's just to say, I have major structural problems with how this this season is laid out. In a, and I do not feel that every episode is laid out in a satisfying way. And this one I do not feel like is particularly satisfying when you get to the end of it. And I just double checked. So this is the shortest episode of okay. the season. It's 35 minutes, it, which is really 30 minutes if you take out all the credits and stuff. So it's like, it's not. It is very much a moving people into place episode. Yeah. But it also doesn't feel like we get them all the way to the place that it's attempting to move them. That we are trying to maneuver Hera and uh, Hera and Ahsoka and Sabine into the positions they will need to be in for the back half of the series to happen. But we don't actually quite get there. Uh, Hera doesn't quite leave yet. Ahsoka and Sabine don't quite have their big turning points yet in this episode. But alrighty, well, next week we will be discovering uh, episode four. We're just going to continue doing this forever. Uh, we're, we're almost at the halfway point of the series. Insane. <laughs> Uh, you can watch a bunch of things that Bradley works on on Peacock and Bravo, and currently we are plugging Married to Medicine Season 10, on which Bradley worked. You can also find me on the TTRPG High Republic podcast for Light and Dice. Uh, we are about to, in a couple of weeks, we're going to record our next session, so new episodes of that will be coming soon. I know we ended in a very dramatic place, but new episodes are coming. Definitely check that show out if you haven't already. I have another thing to plug, but I can't talk about it yet. But it's coming very, very soon. In a matter of fucking days, I will be publicly making an announcement of what that thing is. All right. Well, if that's all, Bradley, go ahead and run the socials. Thank you for listening to this episode of Gold Squadron Gaze. Did Charles fuck something up? Email us at goldsquadrongaze at gmail.com to let us know. You can also find us on Twitter at at Gold Squad Gaze, and you can find us on TikTok and Instagram at at Gold Squadron Gaze. You can also find us on YouTube at our Gold Squadron Gaze YouTube channel, where we post full episodes of this show. Finally, if you liked the show, don't forget to rate us and give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. That allows other people to find our show. As always, thank you for listening to Gold Squadron Gaze, and we'll see you next week. Later. Yeah, and Hera's also not the type of person there's random balloons. What was that? I don't I don't get it either. I don't did, understand. Did I say something that like set it off? That was weird. I don't understand. We're moving on from the okay, balloons. Okay, sorry.